Hey everybody, my name is Paul Fadika. My friend Austin Buddington and I have been working on uh, capsules. So we're not, it's not a specific product, it's not a specific service right now. It's rather a set of patterns and libraries that are very powerful and that I think will be a basis, a base standard for much of sweet programming. So what we're going to be talking about, this discussion is going to be mostly pretty technical, so if you have some familiarity with Move already, that, that'll be helpful, Sweet Move in particular. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll try to hold your hand and um, be gentle. So um, I, I started off back in October, and uh, actually before that, I wanted to do an NFT standard on uh, Aptos. Um, and it di di didn't really work out, I don't really like Aptos. But like, um, and, and then I started off, like for the first two months, I had this project called Newt's. And uh, Newt's, it was like you have a struct, and it's like an NFT, and you have like markets, and you transfer them around, and you can create them, you have like, like a little factory or a candy machine kind of thing. Um, but I took a step back and thought, that's the wrong thing to be building right now. Um, well, take a step back and generalize this, rather. Think more about um, ownership and metadata. So those are the two fundamental things you have to get right. So um, we'll talk about this a little bit in a little bit, but SWE has a notion of ownership, but only for owned objects and not for shared objects. Um, so we need to define that. And the second is uh, metadata. So uh, what is metadata? So metadata is just a uh, way of describing your object to external clients. So you can think of your wallet, your uh, explorer, your um, a marketplace. You want to know like what is this object? How do I describe it? How do I view it? Right. So um, most of the wallet designs are kind of stuck right now in this sort of paradigm that they inherited from Ethereum, which is like the fungible tokens versus the non-fungible tokens, and those are the two. They have columns for them, and then that's all, that's all you do. Right. But like in reality, in Sui and Move, everything is an object, and we don't need to limit ourselves just to like two types of objects. Um, so, for example, I'm, I'm just listing off possible things in future wallet designs that I would like to see. I encourage you guys to be creative with your wallet designs or your marketplaces or whatever you do. Um, so, you can have like currencies, for example. You can have market positions. Um, just think of like objects that represent like a, um, a perpetual, for example, or like a, an, an option. Um, game items, like Cradle was talking about, plenty of those. Um, you have capabilities, which you could think of like it's something you present to do something else. Um, so like the mint, there's like a mint capability if you deploy your own coin, for example. That's, that's the most basic capability to move. Um, you know, ticketing, all sorts of stuff like that. When thinking about how do you define metadata for such a diverse array of, of possible objects. Um, so this is the Metaplex's standard. Um, basically this is how Metaplex did it. It's like there's fungible tokens, there's non-fungible tokens, and here's our structs, and if you don't like the structs, you're kind of out of luck. So, there's a lot of creative teams out there who are coming up with their own ideas for how to do metadata, and uh, they're kind of blocked. Like, um, this is kind of a problem you have to look out for when you're designing a system from the ground up, is that you can move fast at first, but you, if you don't design with extensibility in mind, you'll end up with a system with so much technical debt that it's just hard to add on top of. And that's the situation um, like Solana is basically in right now. Um, so you can see they, they just like, define some, some attributes and then fix types. And uh, that's, that's whether you like it or not, you want to add something else to it, you want to change those, you're, it's not happening. Um, so, and, and then the second, that, that is the first consideration. Um, the second consideration was um, we want to have metadata on chain wherever possible. So uh, th this right here is a DGOD, it sold uh, $220,000 back in uh, September. Um, and you ask yourself, when you buy a Solana NFT, what are you really buying? What are, what are you getting? Um, in fact, all you're getting is a, uh, a, a, a record that points to a, a URL. Um, so the metadata is not actually on chain at all. So all you get is the, and in this case, it's pointing to dgods.com slash 269JSON, because this is dgod 269. So when, when you're paying $220,000 for this NFT, uh, all you're getting is a tradable pointer to a JSON file stored on somebody's AWS server. Um, which is not great. <laughs> um, so if, if this server goes down, uh, if it's unavailable, um, if DGOD decides for whatever reason to, they just want to unilaterally change that. They don't want it to be that cool anymore. They just want to change whatever they want. Um, they, can, they can do that. So wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of way of having a highly available data source, if there was a way of sharing like ownership and, and guaranteeing that people aren't going to just change it from underneath you, um, well, it's called a blockchain. It turns out we have that. Um, 
So a lot of the things that we talk about make other ecosystems look kind of dumb, but it's not that they're dumb, it's just that like, uh, SWE enables us to do things other ecosystems couldn't do. So the, the, when, when Metaplex made the, the, all their metadata off-chain, they didn't do that because they were like, this is a great idea. They did that because of the limitations of Solana. So Solana has a 1200 byte count limit. So that means whenever you create an object um, in one transaction, you only do 1200 bytes. Um, trend, uh, storage is very expensive on Solana. We're talking um, one kilobyte or less is five cents. Back when Solana price was 10x, what it is now is 50 cents. People were paying you know, $5,000 to load a candy machine with 10,000 NFTs. Um, when, and, that, and that's with the metadata off chain. Imagine if it was on chain, how much that would cost them. Um, so they were building around these technical limitations that they had to deal with. Um, but SWE storage is fortunately going to be, I'm hoping, uh, so far in projections, at least the DevNet uh, gas prices are right, it's going to be several orders of magnitude cheaper, which makes metadata on chain uh, viable. Um, so now we arrive at our two guiding principles around capsules, right? Um, we want on-chain metadata because it's highly available. We can control who can edit it and such. And then uh, we want unopinionated schemas. So I don't want to force people to be like, you have to have a name and it's an image and you have to have an image and you have to have these attributes and stuff. Like, I'll leave that to you guys to decide. I'm just going to give you guys the tools for, in, in, for creating data and managing your ownership of your stuff. Um, so before I explain how capsules works, I have to lay a little bit of groundwork. You have to understand a few patterns. Um, so Todd kind of spoke this on day one, but this is the extended pattern. So one of the superpowers of SWE is dynamic fields. So dynamic fields let you grab an arbitrary object and then attach your own fields to it without that other object knowing that you're that you're doing this. Um, so in this case, we have uh, this coder right here. We have an outlaw. Um, I'm just asserting that I, uh, the owner is presenting this outlaw, and then I'm returning a mutable reference to the UID. So the UID is the key that unlocks the dynamic fields. So you've taken a piece out of this outlaw object, and now I can add my own custom field to it, right? So I just go dynamic field add, key, and then whatever I want, in this case, hello world. Um, so you might think that this is insecure in the sense that like, well, if anybody can like add fields, couldn't they change your fields? Like, um, so you notice I'm using a key. So my, uh, because, only my module can construct that key. Only my module can read and write to that specific dynamic field. So the pattern we're going to be doing here is you have an object that somebody creates. Then they pass a mutable reference to the UID to other programs, and then those other programs attach their own data to it. Um, and it makes this very dynamic, composable sort of behavior between the objects. You're composing objects directly. Um, and you can't do this in Aptos. You can't do this in really any other ecosystem. Um, and I think this is kind of a, a game changer. Um, other game changer is a view pattern. So the idea for view pattern is that uh, they call them dev inspectors actually officially, but I call them view functions. Um, the idea is that in this case, you can pass in an outlaw, you pass in a schema object, and then we are returning bytes, which allow you to understand what that, what that is. Um, th these are just some very simple examples. In the second example, I just have my field, which is a struct, and I'm serializing it and then uh, returning it. So you can build your own custom view functions. These, these are like trivial examples, but you can imagine um, like if you had like a coin object and you wanted to return different images depending on like the balance inside the coin. Um, you, you, could, you could create your own custom logic to do that. Um, so you get to decide how your objects will be presented to front-end clients. Um, so first we're going to talk about like ownership and suite. So, in SWE, they have two notions of uh, objects, that states that an object can be in. Right? It can be a shared object or it can be an owned object. Owned object, if you can get a reference to it, you, you have authority to use it. Um, shared objects, it's, it's not that simple. So anybody can get a reference to a shared object, right? And then, um, but the question is how do you gain access to that? How do you gain control of that? And like, SWE is just kind of like has no opinions. They're like, hey, you figure it out. Okay. So that leads to like a lot of um, a lot of uh, custom custom behavior that you have to build in if you have like a, a shared object you want to control. Um, so this is just a toy example I wrote up. So the basic patterns for owning an object is you have objects that are owned by addresses, which is which is a key pair. So like that's a secret key pair that I have, right? And I'm able to produce a transaction. That's how I can assert that I own it. It can be owned by other object IDs, or it can be owned by types. Um, so, if you've ever seen the uh, coin capability uh, treasury cap, 
that's like an example of a type. Um, in, in the case of object IDs, it's like you're presenting that I have this certain object ID, and it's like, look, I have it, see, I can, I, this is my proof of authority that I should be able to modify this in some way. Um, so that makes your interface kind of complicated if you're trying to support all of these. So in this like, toy example, I have like, a bank account. And one bank account can be owned by key pairs, another one can be owned by IDs, another one can be owned by types. Um, kind of a little complicated, and then, um, and then if you want to transfer between you know, these two different bank balances, you do three times three equals nine different like, transfer possible functions. Um, so like, yeah, you're, you're, so let's go for that first one, transfer from object to address. In this case, I'm presenting an owner object, I'm presenting the uh, bank account. These bank accounts are shared balances. They're shared objects, by the way, to clarify. I'm just checking to make sure that it's the owner. Well, I'm getting the object ID of the, the object you presented, and I'm making sure it's bank equals owner. Um, and then I'm allowing you to proceed and like, withdraw a balance, change the balance, et cetera. Um, so I realized we could simplify this with a, uh, a new uh, program that I call Transaction Authority. So you've been using Transaction Authority the whole time under the hood, but you just didn't call it that. You call the transaction context. So if you go inside transaction context, what it has is it has the, the address of the sender. And so you know who the sender is, and you can be like, okay, TX sender equals bank.owner. Okay, great, we'll, we'll keep it going. But what if we could extend it? What if we could extend it and make it more than one address? And what if those addresses, instead of just being like key pairs, what if they could be object baggies? What if they could be types? Like, we could do a lot of things. Um, so, what you do here for this pattern is you call in the TX authority and you present something, like in the case of begin with ID, you're presenting a capability object. So you have this object, it takes the address, adds it to the vectors of authorities. So, and then you can pass this authority object to a future function, and that future function will be like, oh, well, I see that the object ID that you added to this, it's like a rubber stamp, like boom, it's on there, good, we'll pass. Um, we can do the same thing with type capabilities, um, but uh, types are a little more complicated, but essentially what you do is you take the type as a string, you hash it, turn it into like 20 bytes, and then you use that instead. Um, so this really simplifies our bank example. So instead of having like three different banks, we just have one bank, and we don't even define the owner um, in, the, in the module ourselves. Um, so in this case, when we want to create a bank, what we're doing essentially, as I can walk you through these lines, is um, you're setting up the ownership. Okay, so you have proof equals ownership set up. Maybe I'll come over here and this would help a little bit. Um, okay, we're setting this up. What this is doing right here is we're adding this witness right here. So this is a witness that only my bank module can produce. So it's like, how does modules sign for themselves? So modules can't have secrets, right? So my, only my module, the bank module, can produce this witness. So it produces this witness over here, it adds it to this TX authority, and then it passes that along with the proof to, um, the, the, to this bank object to initialize its ID. And that's just a check that I have in for everything, because I don't want other modules initializing ownership for something they don't own. Like, only the module defining the bank object should be able to define ownership for the bank object. You know, so we don't, we don't want other people like hacking stuff. So, so it's initializing ownership, and then it's initializing the transfer authority. You probably won't get in the transfer authority, but it's a set of rules by which ownership can be transferred. Um, and this could be like a different module entirely. But um, yeah, basically just set an owner, and then we're sharing the object. So then in the future, when you want to, let's say, transfer balance, you would just call back into the ownership program, and like, is this authorized by the owner? Okay, we have the, the authorities that we've received so far, right? Which is just that, it's just a vector of addresses that are just, just think of as a vector of addresses that are stamped like, yep, yeah, Paul signs off on this, the bank module signs off on this, that one object we needed a reference to signs off on this, like, and we're just carrying this forward, right? Um, so we can just assert that, that this is authorized by the authorities we would expect, um, and then we can allow the rest to proceed for the, for the transfer. So this allows you to simplify your API, this allows you to simplify who's the ownership. Um, and once dynamic, uh, dynamic transactions or programmable transactions are live, this will be a lot easier in the sense that you can simply produce these auth objects and keep passing them forward throughout your whole execution. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the creation of basically like, it's an outlaw, it's basically the equivalent of like an NFT. So we have a project called Outlaw Sky, so that's why I keep talking about outlaws. Um, but basically, you, we just have a struct and like, all this is an ID, I'm not defining anything, right? And then uh, we're going to add 
ownership fields and metadata fields, add those there as comments so that like, people know what's going to happen. Um, now I create my own OAuth right here. Um, we go through some ownership stuff. I'm initializing it. I'm like, I own this. Basically, I'm, I'm the module that owns this. We added our witness up here. Um, then we're attaching some metadata. We're going to get to metadata in a little bit. But you can see the metadata is coming in. It's just a vector of bytes, a schema that's going to, we're going to talk about schemas in a little bit, but that defines how uh, the data is going to be formatted. Um, so we're just initializing ownership as the, as the module. We're attaching some metadata. Then we're adding the, the actual end owner, which is like the consumer, presumably buying the entity, um, assigning it to a transfer market, and then we're sharing it. Um, and that, that's, that's about all you have to do. So this module, as outlaw, it didn't have to define its own metadata standard. It didn't have to it put all its own fields, the metadata fields didn't have to be arguments in here. Um, the scheme is flexible. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about like metadata, where, where, where that metadata came from. So we have what I, I call an ORM, like an object relational mapping. And like it's nothing special, but uh, we're over in the TypeScript right here. So um, in TypeScript, this would be like a client application. I'm defining like a schema from Outlaws. So I'm like, okay, I want name, description, image, power level, attributes, something like that. That's just a that's just a schema. And then I'm instantiating the schema. You know, attributes, we got background white, we got like an image here, we got a power level, which is U64, description, we can leave that optional. Schema, instantiate schema, and um, JavaScript doesn't actually have runtime types. So like if you really want to be anal and you want to assert it, you can assert being like, yeah, make sure those two things match. Um, and then we're just this is this is actually like all using um, box stuff from Houston Labs. So like they have their own library called BCS. BCS stands for Binary Canonical Serialization. So it was this uh, serialization format that they developed at Facebook as well, along with um, along with Move. Um, so all we're doing is like they have a little library for that. So we're registering a struct type. We're calling it outlaw, and it's our LS schema right up there. Wow. And then uh, then we're serializing this object using the schema. And so we're going to get a bunch of bytes. We're going to get just a bunch of bytes, really simple. And then after that, we're just going to call into our create function, pass the bytes. We're going to pass a reference to a schema object ID. So this is a uh, there's an object on chain that will say something like similar to what we have. It'll it'll list out that uh, that like name, description, image, stuff like that. So that's so on chain we know how to deserialize these bytes that we're getting right here. And now that'll create the function that'll we'll create the object that we had before. Then if you want to go back again, do the reverse. Um, we can do view functions to do the same thing. Um, so in this case, we're just going to call back into our function, view all. We're specifying the object ID, the schema ID that we're expecting. Um, we do a dev inspect transaction. Dev inspect transactions are not costing anything. Like, so like, they're, they're, super, they're super helpful. <laughs> and uh, we get the result, we parse the result, and we deserialize the result, and then we have we have all So like, the original, object that we created, the, this, this right here, we posted that on chain, and then we'll get it back. And like this isn't using any like weird proprietary libraries or anything like that. Um, this is all just like out-of-the-box kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that's like what I call an ORM, anyway, if you guys are familiar with that term. Um, so more generally, there, I didn't get icons for these, wow. Um, more generally, I have defined so far like five types of metadata. Um, so far we've talked about like object metadata. So that's just specific just to uh, an, ob an object. Um, the, but you can also have other types, so uh, abstract type and concrete type. So Demir has something along these lines a little bit. Um, and in the coin metadata, in the coin program, if you look in there, there's kind of like this own uh, notion of like a, a type, a, a concrete type metadata. Um, so let's, let's get into that, actually. So this is like the coin module. Sorry, it's so big, you don't have to through it. But um, th this is how it's currently implemented in really suite. It's like we have a coin metadata object, and it defines all its own fields on chain. You know, decimal, name, symbol, description, icon, URL, and then it shoves all of those into like the uh, the function argument to create it, and then they create like nine other functions to get those and modify all those, right? Um, so let's try simplifying that like a little bit. Um, so the way we can simplify that a little bit is um, we're, we're passing in an abstract type. So if we have something that's not concrete, like uh, coin T, coin T can't exist. Coin T isn't like a concrete type. Coin T is a, um, it's a template to create types. Um, so that's what I mean by an abstract type. So 
I would define some abstract type, and I would presumably like pick a schema similar to the one that they already have in the token metadata program. Then I would pass in the schema, I pass in some data. So I'm returning this type object to you. So you can think of a type object as a singleton sort of store. So like if I've defined this new coin, that's called Paul coin. I'm going to get back this single like object called type Paul coin, and um, I'm going to be able to like we were just doing with the outlaws. I'm going to be able to modify the types and all the metadata stored on it. And then a client application, when they're like, what is this? What is this Paul coin thing? You know, instead of me storing for every object ID all that data, which would be pointless, um, they're just going to call into that one type object and be like, oh, okay, okay, I know what this is. All right, cool. <laughs> and yeah, that helps me control how my type generally is presented. Let's see. Oh, now we're talking about creators. So here's like a pretty innovative idea. Um, so anybody can create a creator object. So you just create, and it's just uh, essentially a list of packages, and then you can attach metadata to it, whatever scheme you want, I haven't decided. Um, so anybody can create one of these. So you can imagine like Google Labs or uh, DGods, you know, they have one of these creator objects. There's this root level of shared object sitting there. But now we can provide kind of like a trust layer to this. Um, so like a big problem that Slums run into, and that Sweet will definitely run into, is um, fake NFTs. So like, how do you know somebody's gonna like steal some artwork mint it on chain, create a thousand of them, airdrop them, and how do you, just, how as a marketplace, how do you distinguish from these real ones with these fake ones? So this is kind of where a creator comes in. So when I publish a package, I suppose I, call, I publish Outlaw, I publish Outlaw, I get an Outlaw Sky uh, package, uh, publish receipt back, and then I use that to, and then I add that to my creator. So now I, I've proven that I, let's suppose Paul, Paul uh, Capsis, um, and then I add that. I, I use the publisher receipt to prove that I was the publisher. Paul, the creator, was the, the publisher of this package. And now anything that comes from that package, any objects produced by that package can be attributable to me, to my creator object, right? Because we've linked the two. And so what if we used dynamic fields in the extend pattern to allow people to add their own stamps to my creator object, to my creator object? So you can imagine uh, Mist and Labs themselves you could imagine uh, Origin Byte, Shinami, um, Keepsake, anybody. Um, they would essentially call in as, and they would add their stamp of approval to a creator object. Be like, this creator is legitimate. And then um, somebody like Ethos Wallet, they could see that. And they'd be able to query that. And they'd be like, okay, this NFT was produced by this one package. This package is owned by Yuga Labs. And Yuga Labs is stamped by Mistin Labs <laughs> as legitimate. So now I know to display this, that I'm, I feel safe to display this rather than some other sketchy shop that doesn't have that. And these endorsements can be added and removed. And so that's kind of like a trust and safety layer system. Um, it, the idea, I, I took the idea from um, SSL certificates. So essentially when you get an SSL certificate, you, it's signed by an authority and it's like, oh, I trust Google, this is Google's signature. Yeah, so now I can proceed. Um, that was pretty much what I wanted to talk about for like the, the main focus of my timer. I'm not sure how far along I am. Um, but uh, thanks everybody for uh, chilling, chilling and uh, listening. Um, Do you have any questions and stuff? Yeah, I'd love to hear questions from anybody. Wow. Well, before we get any further, I think it would be great if everyone could give a round of applause to Paul. <laughs> These are the types of, uh, you know, like innovations, the types of primitives, the patterns that I think are really important that we get right at the beginning. And I just really appreciate you know, all the thought and energy you've been putting into these types of things. It's very clear, and you know, you've taken a lot of stuff into consideration. So thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, we are running a little tight on time, and so just in the interest of making sure we were finished on time, would you be open to taking Q&A? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Wow. Okay. Yes, you can. If it's you. Okay, yeah. Paul, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Um, we have this issue with Explorer, right? With issuers and owners, because as you can understand, the John is and they can own to solve and sell objects. How, for every type of uh, asset on stream, if something is owned inside a set object, how do we show it to the Explorer? Mm, you're talking about nested objects? Any, any object, anything that is shared, and you have the information of the ownership, somehow conceptually, you know, there's a map or a table pretty much like Ethereum with the hash map. Some people are actually doing this part and we see it, right? Can they use anything of your 
like uh, patterns here to actually have a standard, and this is how we're presenting ownership. If the ownership is not defined by move, by oh, ownership by anymore, yeah. but it's defined inside the smart contract. Exactly, exactly. That, 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 well, having a standardized ownership model really helps with that. Because like all the ownership module is doing is just adding a, a dynamic field called owner, and then it's like an address. So if that is addressed as a key pair, that's easy to understand. If that address is a hash of, let's say, a type, it's a little less obvious. It's an, it's a, it's an object that should be easy to understand. Um, so yeah, um, that, that's going to be an issue. So like I want to be able to index um, owner on, on, the, on the owner field um, for shared objects. That way, like when you say, hey, find everything I own, find, you can find everything you own. Not just the owned objects, but also the, the, the shared objects that, that you have access to. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think I think an in we it's really an index of the problem. We need like an index to be able to sort that all out so you can have a fast career.